David said, uh, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. And you know, the one thing that pulls us together is family. According to Hebrews, it says, once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And it's that one thing that really brings us all together is the mercy of God. So in light of that, I'd like to do a call to worship this morning. And because of that mercy, we have so much to be thankful for. In Psalm 95, it says, Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The depths of the earth are in his hand mountain peaks are his. The sea is his. He made it. His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. Father, as we get ready now to offer our thanksgiving to you and our praise for your mercy, for your goodness, for your care, that we are your people and the sheep of your hand. Lord, we turn to you now and offer that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we all stand together?
for he is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to his temple draw near. Praise him in glad adoration. Praise to the
I want to do something a little different. Why don't we go right to Psalm 16? I want you to see the words of this song. And especially as we sing this together about the presence of the Lord, this is what we mean when we sing this. This is what the Word of God says. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, and I want us to read verse 11 as a congregation. Listen to the words of the song. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs, instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. And now altogether, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. All together, church, come on, say. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known oh i stay in the garden him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And the joy we share as we tarry there. None other has ever known. Father, this morning as we think about the words of David in Psalm 16, Lord, we think about the way he says that apart from you he has no good. The Lord, even in his relationships and associates, that which brings him delight is those who are saints, those who know you. God, you were his refuge. Lord, you were his great inheritance. And Father, we think about those words of David. We think about the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 1, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Father, we know that when we die, we gain it all because we gain you for all eternity. Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. 
Lord, what an inheritance lies before us. Father, what, we, uh, what, what a great destiny and a future that we have to look forward to with you. And Lord, we thank you that even in this moment, Lord, even as we sing this hymn together in the garden, God, we, we can look forward and we can even participate in this moment, in that day in part, when we will be in the garden with you again. And we will eat again from the tree of life. So, Father, we thank you for your presence, for the turning of your face toward us in Jesus. We look to him and we thank you for the salvation we have in him and him alone. In the stillness I know that you are God In the secret of your presence I know There I am restored And when you to set me free. Now I live to bring you praise. In the chaos, in confusion, I know you're sovereign still. In the moment of my weakness, you give me grace to do your will. And when you call, I won't delay. This my song through all my days. Oh! 
Well, good morning. Now, there's some little people in here that want to sing this morning. So we'd like to have them come up. If you're first or fifth grade and you're going to chill church, come on up. Or you want to sing with us. The ones who don't want to sing can kind of sit down here on the floor. So kids, if you could come up now, that'd be great. I know some kids that really want to sing. I know some kids that are thinking about it, but not quite there yet. Okay, so go up on the stage. All the singers are going to go up on the stage, all right? Good spot. All right, so we're going to do a little song for you, okay? You guys ready? Don't forget to smile.
Thank you guys. Very good job. You guys are going that way, I think. All right. Thanks, E. Couple announcements. Guess what's coming in just a couple weeks? That's it. I didn't hear that. I still didn't hear that. What's coming in a couple weeks? Trunk or tree. That's very, very good. Now, there's a display out there in the foyer, and you can sign up to do trunks and bring candy and all those kind of things. Again, it's a whole congregation event. We need everybody involved, okay? There's also a few pumpkins on the parking lot. How many noticed that? All right. Pumpkins on the parking lot for you, okay? Those are for the youth ministry to sell and to help them on their trips and stuff like that. So that's what the pumpkins are out there for. Another one is we have an all-church work day next Saturday on the 21st, like 9 to 12, to get our property ready for Trunk or Treat. Again, if you're new to Faith Bible Church and you haven't heard about Trunk or Treat before, we're expecting around 2,500 people to fill our parking lot. So bring lots of candy is a good word on that, yes. And there's also a Legacy Grandparenting Summit that's going to be at Tony Evans Church this Thursday and Friday. I'm going, and if anybody wants to join me, you're welcome to join me, okay? So it's a seminar on grandparenting on Thursday and Friday. All right. There's also a QR code that's up there from time to time, and you can scan it, scan it for more information, okay? All right. I think that's all. If the usher would like to come forward, we're going to have the offering. All right. Let me go ahead and pray. Lord, again, we pause in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you care for us and you know our name. Thank you, Lord. You know the very number of hairs on our head, Lord, and you care deeply for us, for you have made us and created us in your image. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you that we could come and worship and learn about you and learn about your word. Lord, we pray that we'll leave this place encouraged, Lord, and challenged, Lord, to want to serve you more, love you more, and with great expectation, look for what you're going to do in our lives. Lord, we know that you have us here for a purpose, and that purpose is to change people's lives to introduce them to Jesus, and to show them, Lord, how they can have a personal relationship with you. So, Lord, uh, again, we thank you for the offering and time to give back what you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, that you love a cheerful giver, Lord. And, Lord, uh, this delights you when your people serve you, when they sing your praises, when they come to worship, when they come to learn your word, and when they come to give. We thank you for our church and our church missionary families that we have and to all the things the offering goes for Again, we thank you most for the people you have in this room and online. Again, we ask your blessing upon this and this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I sure wish I was a one-man band. I don't know how you do it. Well, this is my delight today to present someone that's been a friend of mine for a lot of years, and I've been praying for this Sunday and waiting for this Sunday for months. So I'm glad you're here, and you're going to be glad you're here too. Now, this individual that's going to come, his name is Phil Tuttle. He is the president of Walk Through the Bible. How many know what Walk Through the Bible is? Raise your hands. Okay. How many never heard of it, but it sounds like a really cool name? All right, okay, all right, okay. Well, great, you're going to find out a little bit today. And today, Phil's going to share in here the life of Gideon, and he's also going to share in the choir room. We may have to move it back here. There's some, like, light refreshments. If you can stay with us after church for a little bit, we want you to do that. So Phil will speak about 30 minutes on what's going on in Ukraine and the world and Uganda and around the world. 
Walk Through the Bible is an international ministry that's in about 140 countries, something like that. And we actually have 25,000 to 30,000 Walk Through the Bible teachers worldwide. Now, when I started with Walk Through the Bible, we used to meet in the presence basement, and we had about 30 teachers. So it's grown just a little bit. And one of the biggest reasons for that growth is, is, is the man you're going to hear right now. He is a dear friend. Get ready to fall in love with God's Word. Phil, would you come? Thank you, sir. That was all Jerry's nice way of saying we're really old. Um, <laughs> that's basically what happened there. Uh, how many of you were at um, family camp summer before this one? A few of you? Yeah, okay, that's why some of you look familiar. I stare at you and can't think of your name. I'm terrible at names, but faces usually stick in my mind. I love this church. Uh, got to lead your camp, family camp years ago when um, Mark Bailey was serving as your pastor. And um, it's just great to be back this morning. I really come um, partially to at least try to begin to pay back a debt. Um, the story of Walk Through the Bible and the story of Faith Bible are, are really intertwined in ways that you probably don't realize. A lot of you probably know Jerry is a Walk Through the Bible instructor. Has been since 1983, which was about five years after he started serving here at Faith. I was trained in 1988 and um, then began serving full-time with Walk Through the Bible in 92 have been there ever since, and about the last 15 years or so have been leading the ministry. What you may not know, though, is how God has leveraged your unselfishness with Pastor Jerry. Um, you know that he goes out and he teaches sometimes in um, churches, sometimes in Christian schools, sometimes in prisons. Um, we pick those instructors very carefully by who will fit in best there. I don't know what that says about Jerry, but um, along about, I don't know what year this would have been, kind of early to mid-90s, Walk Through the Bible was at that point exclusively a ministry for adults, and Jerry was the driving force that said, look, this will work with children too. Um, our president at the time, Bruce Wilkinson, didn't really have a vision for that, he had developed um, the prototype of walk through the Old Testament uh, as his master's thesis at Dallas Seminary. And it just was, it was birthed in an adult world in kind of an academic setting. And Jerry started playing around with it. And really, Jerry and, and another guy built the prototype of walk through the Old Testament and then walk through the New Testament. Now, you fast forward that um, about five years ago, we felt God encouraging us as a ministry to just chase a bold vision of trying to double the impact of our ministry from 2 million people a year to 4 million people a year. And all of us prayed about this, and it seemed like whether it was the board or our 10 regional directors around the world, our staff, um, even our donors, everybody said, yes, let's go, let's go. And um, shortly after we launched that, three months into that, COVID hit, which of course we had built into our master plan. Um, what an ideal, and even our board chair said, you know, nobody's going to hold you to that three-year vision, Phil. You've got, I mean, nobody expects that. And I'm like, we either heard from God or we didn't hear from God. We think we heard from God. And so we chased it. And a big part of that was to take honestly, what Jerry, by the unselfishness of your church, had birthed, and to just try to grow that all around the world. Fast forward to our year just ended June 30. Um, we last year got to teach, walk through the Old Testament or New Testament. We're talking about only to children, okay, at this point, this number, to 1.3 million people globally. So, Jerry would be quick to say, I had a lot of help, and I guess he did, but it's always a vision is usually birthed through one person, and that cannot be taken away from the connection with your church being unselfish with Jerry and the rest of your staff. So, I come for a lot of people that you probably won't meet until heaven 
just to say thank you. The exciting thing about that number, um, I'm not supposed to put a percentage on this because we haven't calculated this closely enough, but I know this number to be true just from reports we get. Of that 1.3 million kids, more than half of those are being taught in public schools around the world. So just think about that for a minute. I long for the day when that may be legal in our country. It is not currently the case. But um, God, may you please hear our prayers and allow that to happen. Uh, do we have Gideons here today? Did I hear there's like some Gideons here training people for trunk or treat? Amen. Thank you for what you all do. Um, we, we partner with the Gideons unofficially in a lot of places. You know, with, without the scriptures, it's just tough. Just tough. It's Wycliffe, Gideons, walk through the Bible. I mean, the best ministry is done in, in partnership and in teamwork. Will you pray with me? And then I want to introduce you to the Gideon that maybe you never knew, because we kind of short, shortcut his story and we missed some of the most important part of it. Father, thank you for this church. Lord, I do thank you for Jerry and Kathy. Thank you for um, their kids who were unselfish with their dad also sometimes. And Lord, just thank you for the miracle of multiplication as what was really birthed in a lot of ways as a ministry of, of this church and, and others who were part of this church who also became instructors for us. Lord, how that has supernaturally multiplied even to the ends of the earth. Lord, continue to grow that for your glory. And now as we look at the story of Gideon, Lord, help us to move beyond Veggie Tales' understanding of this character and uh, really look at what was going on in his mind and heart. Because we're a lot more like him and he's a lot more like us than I think we ever would have dreamed, dear Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't know about you, but when I... Um, when I look at the news these days, it's easy to be discouraged, fearful. Um, Ukraine, specifically Kyiv, is the hub of most of our work in the former Soviet Union. Parts of Eastern Europe are coordinated through Romania, but all the countries uh, in northern Eurasia, Kyiv is our hub. Um, we have seen the impact of the war and the devastation that it has brought firsthand, or very much secondhand, I guess, through the team that we have there that we love. Walk Through the Bible is not a sending agency of those 25 or 30,000 that Jerry mentioned. Outside the U.S., there's probably not 50 Americans involved in that. It's purely a national-driven organization. And there's still very much a need for American missionaries and missionaries from other countries to go. But we're more a finding ministry. We find people who have an interest in God's word. We put our tools in their toolbox, and they already know the language. They already understand the culture. They're not going to come home after a few years, and they already like the food, <laughs> which is a bonus. Pray for my trip in India in January. That's always a challenge for my wife Ellen and me, but um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not just Ukraine. Now, of course, the battle that's, that's waging in the Middle East is a, is a lot of heartache, and we have, we have ministry in both of, the, both of the groups involved, not with Hamas, but of course, many Palestinians aren't represented well by Hamas, and there's Walk through the Bible is active there. Walk through the Bible is active in, in Israel by some who have embraced Jesus as their Messiah. And I just, I grieve when I watch the news. Our daughter, since college, has been involved with a children's home in Guatemala. It's called Casa Bernabe, House of Barnabas. And um, she just got home from a trip um, about a week and a half ago and she is now on the board of that children's home down there. In fact, she says, I think I stepped out of the room to go to the restroom at the wrong time because I'm now the chair of our board. Um, some of you can relate to what that's like. And she's like, this is nuts, Dad. And 
Uh, she's 35 years old. She's like, how did this happen? You got to help me. And I just love seeing her faith and her dependence on the Lord being stretched. But she came back, and now she says, you know what's happening in Guatemala? The president who lost the election has said he didn't really lose. And in their case, it doesn't even matter because they have one term limit anyway. You can only serve one term, but he has expressed his desire to stay in office, and now people have taken to the streets to protest against that. And um, it's not super violent yet, but it could easily get that way. There's wars. There's rumors of wars. We as a nation internally are deeply divided, are we not? The polarization seems to get worse by the year. And aren't we glad just uh, next month will just be one, one year away from another election? We live in Georgia where the election isn't even done when the election is done. We always have extended. We go into overtime, and it's not as fun as football when that happens. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, extra innings with elections. There's so many reasons to be concerned. For so many churches, COVID, which should have been the church's finest hour as people lost confidence in, in um, even government authorities or our technology or the other things that that we lean on. People lost confidence in so many of those things. It should have been the church's finest hour. And I'm telling you, your church did better than most. For many churches, there was just deep division at a time like that. I walked by, in fact, I actually snuck a, a, a picture of it. I was being led around this morning by a faithful brother, and I snuck a picture of your dispenser that says, spread the gospel, not germs. And Right there, you can get your hand. I thought, wow, there's the perspective we ought to have. You know, you look back, this is not the first time. We, I, we hear all the time that this is unprecedented. It's never been this bad before. The sky is falling. America has never been more divided. There's that little thing called the Civil War that did occur, but, you know. But back in Bible times, God had great leaders. He had men like Moses. He had women like Esther. Now you look around. Look at the people near you. He's got guys like Daryl. He's got people like Dee Dee. He's got like people like Jerry and Jessica. And it's like, how does he get anything done? You just wonder that. He's got, he's got people like Phil, and I'm one of the few speakers that you've had who's not part of the faculty of Dallas Seminary. I notice in the bulletin you've given me an honorary doctorate. I'm neither a doctor nor a nurse, but thank you for that. I mean, you, you've had more doctors through here. You're not suffering from malnutrition in your time between pastors. You've had great Bible teaching. And I, you know, I mean, it's, 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 just, it's just amazing how God is providing for your church. And I can walk in because I travel a lot. I can walk in a place. I sat in on a Sunday school class today that Mark was leading. I can pick up in a very short amount of time what's the spirit of a church. And your church is doing just fine. Praise God. Because you've never built it around a superstar person other than Jesus himself. So rejoice over that for sure. But, but really... We, we set ourselves up for this misunderstanding because we've taken these Bible heroes, we've bronzed them, we've set them in trophy cases, and we walk by and we're like, hello, Moses, nice to see you. And, and, you know, and we just, in our hearts, we believe that they were fundamentally different than we are. They're hard to relate to. We do this with Gideon, and I didn't plan, I guess the spirit planned, for me to speak on Gideon, you didn't tell me that Gideons were here doing some training. Uh, that's just all, you know, that's all just extra fun today um, to be able to say thank you to that group. But, you know, we know Gideon, he rallied an army, he um, pushed back the enemy. Uh, there was that time when his faith kind of wavered. He did the deal with the fleeces. We'll talk about that. But I mean, it, it's like, it's like he, God told him he had too many people. Who ever heard of that? They sent most of them home. Gideon wins this great victory. 
to celebrate. He travels throughout Israel, in fact, throughout the whole world, everywhere he stays, he leaves a Bible in the hotel room. We know the story of Gideon from the Old Testament. Well, well, that's Gideon in Judges chapter six or seven. We're going to look today at Gideon in Judges chapter six, because this is the real Gideon. This is the Gideon that I've entitled this the hero in your mirror, your, your bulletin may say, uh, the reluctant hero. Either of those are ideal totals, or titles, totals, titles. Um, because most of us don't think when we look in the mirror that God has much to work with. I bet he wishes he had people like Gideon who never struggled, never were afraid, never had doubts. Well, let's just see about that, shall we? We pick up the story in verse 11. My clicker is not functioning. There we go. Oh, you doing it? It's not working. There we go. Okay. If it doesn't work, I'll know one person is paying attention. And in fact, why don't, why don't you just run us through this? I will take this and set this aside. Let's look at this. It says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Background, you know the book of Judges. The people became weak because they didn't obey God. God lets foreign enemies push in on Israel's boundary. Eventually it gets the people's attention. They cry out to God, help! Not a real deep prayer life because they weren't very used to praying. God raises up a judge, not like a courtroom judge, Judge Wapner, Judge Judy, whoever your favorite TV judge is, but a military leader rallies an army, pushes the enemy back, then they relax. Lord, it's good to know you're there in an emergency. You think about after 9-11, what was church attendance like here? Was it packed? Sure was in our church in Atlanta. And we're like, revival has come, and it lasted about three weeks. Because that's how we are as people. God, it's good to know you're there in an emergency, but the Lord doesn't want his number to be 911. He wants to be number one on our speed dial. Not last resort, but first option. Because he's all about this relationship. That's why he made us in the first place. And so the Midianites are oppressing the people, and they didn't just come in and conquer them. Instead, they came year after year after year. They would let the Israelites plant the crops, the Midianites would come in and do the harvesting, carry back all they could back to Midian, and then scholars tell us they'd burn a lot of the rest of it. This is so depressing. Should I, we even plant this year? And here's Gideon, and he's beating out wheat in a wine press. A wine press is an enclosed structure. It's not the place to beat out wheat. My uncle Leroy and Aunt Shirley for years, we were wheat farmers out in, in southwest Nebraska, and we would go out there to help with the harvest. I'm sure my dad and my brother and my sister and I were a big help with the harvest, being city people who had no clue what we were doing. We were just largely in the way, but he let us drive some trucks and occasionally run a combine, and there were some really cool designs I made in the field. It's, those things aren't as easy to make go straight as I thought they would be. One time I was in a bin, and this wasn't a life-threatening thing, but I was in a bin, and they started dumping some more grain in, just a little bit. The dust from that can just choke you out. You don't beat wheat in an enclosed structure unless you're doing it in hiding. And imagine the dilemma Gideon's feeling. He needs this wheat to feed his family, but if they eat all of it now, what will they plant next year but if they plan it next year, what's the use of that? The Midians will probably be back. He is brought very low along with his people. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I think Gideon is feeling like anything but a mighty warrior at this point, don't you? Look how Gideon responds in the next verse, verse 13. Beep. 
You take this ahead one. There we go. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? You ever feel like asking that question? Or do you do what I do? You kind of proofread your prayers a little bit. Lord, I'm tempted to express confusion and even anger and disappointment with this, but Lord, I know that you are sovereign. I know that you don't make mistakes. Therefore, I will not verbalize those things, which is tremendously effective, except God reads our thoughts anyway. I used to read Psalms as a, as a teenager, and I'm like, this guy, David, is more messed up than I am. How did his stuff ever get into the Bible? Because God treasures authenticity and being real. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? The exodus was just central in people's minds, but it had become a long time since then. The victories under Joshua's leadership were great, but this is the book of Judges where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Aren't you glad you don't live in a culture like that? I'll bet back then they had to take a Gallup poll to decide if something was moral or immoral. I bet they talked a lot about tolerance because, well, your truth is really equal, equally valuable as my truth. It's exactly where we're living today. But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. Keep going. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But Lord, Gideon asked, How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. If you summarize his response in one word, he feels inadequate. Anybody ever here, here ever feel inadequate? Now for him, the argument is, I'm from the wrong tribe, and I'm not even from the right part of the tribe. We don't talk like that very often. For years, I thought I couldn't serve God because I was too young. God is officially taking care of that. <laughs> our first church where we candidated, do not do this, by the way, when you're looking for your next pastor. It was in a town of 850 in Illinois, no stoplights. I mean, this would have been like the metropolis where we would come to shop here in DeSoto, really. This, this town where we live, 24 miles from the nearest McDonald's, which is hard to do in America. Um, we were there nine days candidating. There were no motels, so they put us in a different house every night for nine days. Day six, I couldn't find my wife. I finally found her. She was in the fetal position in the bathroom of this house. She's like, I can't do this anymore. But God stirred our hearts for those people, and we had six great years, six hard years there. On the last Sunday, when the people were voting to affirm the, the decision, I'm in the back with the elderberries, and we're together, and one of them goes, how old are you? And I said, I'm, I'm 26. And they had a rule that you couldn't even teach adult Sunday school until you were 30. And I said, yeah, we may need to look at that rule, because <laughs> some of your sons are, and daughters are really gifted communicators. Well, one guy goes, I got a tractor older than you. And I said, I'll, I'll probably make a lot of mistakes. And they said, then we better have a lot of grace. I reminded them frequently during the next years that I was keeping my campaign promises. <laughs> Would they please keep theirs? But this idea of feeling inadequate, I used to think that disqualified me from serving God. For years, I was too skinny. <laughs> that is rude. <laughs> shame, shame on you. Get that? I'm here to get all this nastiness out of your system before a potential pastor comes to visit so you can be on good behavior. 
I was on Ovaltine three times a day. I was 6'1", 143 when I graduated from high school. I'm still 6'1". I'm, I'm still 143, but we converted to the metric system, and it's, it's different. I used to think that a sense of inadequacy disqualified us from serving God. I now think the opposite. God says, my strength is perfected in your... Paul wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He also wrote all about spiritual gift. But then he also says, you, know, you want to see God the most clearly? When you do something that's out of your comfort zone. When you don't feel adequate. Why are so many of our favorite communicators introverts by personality type? Because those of us who are introverts realize, God, without your help, this is never going to work. And I think we're quicker to give God the credit and the glory when he speaks his word through us. He doesn't call the qualified. You've heard this before. He qualifies those he's called. You summarize this in a point, and there's going to be three of these truths. Here's the first one. God calls inadequate people to incredible ministries. Say that with me. Okay, I know you can read. Now close your eyes and say it by memory. Ready? Here we go. God calls... Right. So if you feel inadequate, it's okay. God says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. There's different words for dishes in the scripture. Like we have the china. It resides in the china cabinet. And the kids and I would walk by the china cabinet and go, hello, China. Are are there still eight of each of you? Good to see you. Some of the most uncomfortable meals of my life is when Ellen, who grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, very southern, and it's like all this extra silverware. Am I, you know, am I doing a lobotomy or are we having turkey here? I don't know what to do with all of these forks. And we also got Corel for our wedding. You can drop Corel and it will bounce back. I think that's closer to the word earthen vessels. How does God's glory come shining through? Sometimes it's through the fault line. So if you ever feel you're married to a crack pot, that's good. He's qualified to serve God. That was extra credit for us guys. We need that. (laughs) Let's jump down to verse 25. So God says, rally an army, push the Midianites away. That same night, the Lord said to him, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You didn't say anything about my family. You said rally an army and go push the enemy away. How many of you are like me You find the toughest place to have an impact for Jesus Christ is with your own family. You got a weird Uncle Harold? I got a lot of weird uncles that my wife was not allowed to meet pre-wedding because my mom was afraid she would run away. I I, I mean it. We've We've got nephews and nieces and and. I mean, some of the biggest heartbreaks of most of our lives come from those who are closest to us. That's where God sends him first. I love the statement. It's not said in Scripture, but I think it's taught in Scripture. Think globally. Act locally. Act locally. You know, I mean, there's there's a conference going on over at Wycliffe right now, 900 people participating into it. It's global. It's absolutely global. That does not erase the opportunity that you have coming up on Halloween. Did you say 2,500 people are going to show up to your parking lot? What an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, 
So he's told to do this, tear down your dad's altar first, build a proper altar in its place. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his men. Jump ahead one more, will you please? Gideon took 10 of his men and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. I have heard so many sermons about this that say half faith is no faith at all. Half obedience counts for nothing. That preach is great. I just don't see it in the passage. He was afraid, so he did it at night. There's not one hint of condemnation from the Spirit of God in this account that he did it. I think it was kind of smart, don't you? I do. I mean, I understand that faith and fear are opposites. The opposite of fear is not courage, it's faith. Read through the Gospel of Mark, look at all the times that that these two play against each other. Stop fearing, only believe. But I somehow got the idea growing up that, that faith and fear never coexist. I can still remember the first time our youth pastor talked some of us into going and sharing our faith with people who had visited our, our student ministry. We were learning all the verses, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, verses that I still use to this day when I share the gospel. I went to that training because there's a girl I wanted to date, and the youth pastor promised that she would be there. That's terrible to confess that. That's not on my resume for a walk through the Bible. By the way, she didn't even show up. We finished 12 weeks, and he goes, now we'll start going to visit people. I'm like, no, my parents pay you a lot of money to reach my friends for Jesus Christ. This is not my job. He goes, actually it is. And and we, we went, the first time we went out, it was terrible. We went to the house, and nobody answered the door. The second house we went to, he goes, okay, he goes, knock. And I go, I, I pounded on that door. I go, oh, sorry to turn around. And I'm like, guess he wasn't one of the elect anyway. Let's go. And uh, went to the third house, and this time, the, our youth pastor, he just choked. And he goes, hi, I'm Pastor Greg, and this is... And he just turns to me, and he blanks on my name. And he says he makes up a name. And the guy on the other side of the door goes, no, it's not, that's Phil. We're in the same algebra class. So we, we didn't get off the porch. And we're walking back to the car, and I'm like, you're really good at this. And he's like, shut up, get in the car. You want to go get a pizza? And his dare I say, incompetence, made me go, hey, he goes, you want to try this again next week? I go, I can't let you going around town embarrassing Jesus <laughs> by yourself. That, that is a true story right there. <laughs> In the morning when the men, this is verse 28, when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with the Asherah pole beside it, cut down, and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built offer altar. They ask each other, who did this? When they carefully investigated, they were told, Gideon, son of Joash, did this. The men of the town demanded of Joash, bring out your son. He must die because he has broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Better to offer him one life than that Baal take out vengeance on all of us. This is a shocker, verse 31. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, are you going to plead Baal's case, Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his widow altar. That's in the Hebrew. You don't really see that in English there. So that day they called Gideon Jero Baal, saying, let Baal contend with him because he broke down Baal's altar. Question, when did his dad all of a sudden get this faith? It's his dad's altar that was torn down. His dad is not walking with God. I think it's the fact that he goes, this is not like my son. If my son has done this, God must have told him to. 
He's not some Rambo of the faith. He's a fearful guy. For him to take this step, it's got to be God at work in his life. You summarize this point. Here's the second one. You're going to see a pattern in these. God calls fearful people to faithful ministries. Say that with me. We got word recently, um, somebody emailed me something from Ukraine, he goes, you got to read this account. It was about a 14-year-old boy, and he was involved, um, not at a church, he was involved like kind of, he, it was a cultural club. He says, sometimes we listen to classical music, sometimes we visit art galleries, sometimes we talk about great leaders in history, and he says, this one time, they came and they taught us this walk through the Old Testament. They used hand signs, creation, fall, flood, nation. Yeah, look at you. You're also programmed. You know them. And um, he said, it was very interesting, and it made me think a lot about God. You didn't get the impression as you read his account that he was necessarily a Christ follower yet. He said about two weeks after that, he and three of his friends were on the street and the air raid sirens went off. It's required by law that you find a shelter and go there. And so he says, we went down in the shelter and he says, the, it was just packed in there. The lights kept going on and off. And he says, then they went off and they just stayed off. He said it was his word getting creepy in there. Whatever creepy means to a 14-year-old boy. That's what it was like said babies were crying and he said i said to my friends hey take your phones turn on the light on your phones and shine it on my hands and he says there in the bomb shelter i said to people this is the bible and he began teaching creation fall and he didn't even know much about the stories in between he filled in what he could but he went all the way from creation, 40 steps to Christ. And he said, this is the Bible. This will sustain us. And there's applause in the bomb shelter. And he said, it wasn't long after that that the siren stopped and he and his friends left. And he said, ever since then, we've been, we've been talking about, can there really be a God? Does he exist? Well, this is faith in the midst of fear, is it not? This is saying we need help. We're, we're overwhelmed by an enemy that's like much bigger than we are. We're powerless in this bomb shelter. And he's like, the Bible has the answers. Praise God. Praise God. Someday, someday it's highly possible I, I, I hope in heaven we get to trace our spiritual genealogy. My mother-in-law did that. My wife's a descendant from Thomas Mayhew, the first missionary in America. She's a direct descendant. We've done the Tuttle family tree, too. We have many mission fields in the Tuttle family tree, so her family would have something to do with their lives. <laughs> but wouldn't it be cool to, in heaven, trace your spiritual genealogy? It's not at all out of the realm of possibility that somebody that Jerry trained trained somebody who trained somebody who trained somebody who trained somebody who trained somebody who, trained somebody who taught that young boy, Ilya, teaching in that bomb shelter. Wow. We got to hurry. I love this church. There's no, oh, there is a clock. Okay. <laughs> It says the same as mine on my phone does. <laughs> Verse 33, Now all the Midianites, the Malachites, and other eastern peoples joined forces and crossed over the Jordan, camped in the valley of Jezreel. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizrites to follow him. He sent messengers throughout Manasseh, calling them to arms, also into Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali. By the way, I don't know how to pronounce those names either, but they taught us at Dallas Seminary, you say them in boldness, and people will go, oh, that's how you pronounce it. So that has served me well for many years. 
Gideon said to God, look at this, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor. If there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand. God says, go for it. You get the picture, he puts a sheepskin, like there's this rug here, a sheepskin would be much thicker. He says, if I get up in the morning, this is wet, the ground is dry, I'll know you've sent me. We still use that expression, I put out a fleece, right? Well, he gets up in the morning, ground is dry, picks up the fleece, rings it soaking wet. What does he do next? He does not go into battle. He goes, Lord, would you do it again tonight? Only tonight, flip-flop it. Make all the ground wet and the fleece dry. Now, there are different interpretations of this, okay? We write doctoral dissertations about this. Don't split a church over this, okay? Some say, well, maybe the fleece was more dense than... The rest of the ground, therefore, evaporation occurred more slowly. I was a math and science nerd. I was a chemistry major. I was in medicine, headed to be a doctor when God veered me off into Bible teaching. I would subscribe to this theory. We're really good at taking what God does supernaturally and then explain it away naturally. There's another explanation. Some of you go, I don't even know what that meant about the density and all that. Well, you'll like option B. Hezekiah St. Bernard, who's never on a leash like he's supposed to, maybe he wandered into my yard, maybe he did his business on the fleece because it was softer. There's no way he'll hit the whole yard, though, and miss the fleece. You can hold either of those views, okay? Don't disqualify a pastoral candidate over that deep doctrine right there. Look for bigger stuff than that. God goes, fine. 39, Gideon said, don't be angry with me. Let me just make this one more request. And he explains that test. That night, God did it. Sure enough, only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. The third truth for us this morning, God calls doubting people to daring ministry. Say that with me. God calls... I grew up in a church that in very many ways was a great church. It was a great church. I grew up with a high view of Scripture. The church was clear on the gospel. On this, our church did not do very well. The message that was communicated to us was, if you doubt, like one bad apple can spoil the whole barrel, you'll you'll mess up everybody else's faith. And there was also a tendency to, you know, let's add some things to Scripture that the Bible doesn't really say to make sure our teenagers behave themselves. And I, I would sometimes raise my hand, and more than one occasion I would ask a difficult question. I remember one time it being pointed out, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but that 92% of Teenagers who had had premarital sex had first danced together. Therefore, you better not ever dance. And I don't know why I did this. I said, Pastor Greg, I said, you know, there's a new study out that 100% of teenagers who had premarital sex had been breathing at the time. (laughs) Causation and correlation are not the same thing. And I was told... Many times, Phil, God has given you a good mind, but if you keep using your mind to ask hard questions, he will take away your mind. Went to Wheaton College in spite of the fact that it was a Christian school because they had a good pre-med program. Planned on staying there one year. My parents said, if you'll go there one year, we'll pay half of your tuition wherever you transfer to. I said, how bad can it be for one year? And God ambushed me and got a hold of my heart. And I fell in love with him, and I also fell in love with his scriptures. Changed my life. What am I saying? The safest place on earth ought to be when believers gather at Faith Bible, whether that's in Sunday school or a small group. 
That ought to be the safe place when you hit the dark night of the soul and you're struggling to go, I'm, I'm asking some questions. That the ushers don't take you out at that point. Call the herd to make the herd stronger. No, no. Especially as America gets more and more post-Christian, we've got to be willing to engage on the hard questions, do we not? We've got to be. Well, I'm sure my time is up. But you look at these three things. These are as true today as they were with Gideon. Yes, he rallies an army. Yes, God whittles it down because he says it's too many people. You win the battle this way. You'll think you did it. Maybe that's what's been happening at Faith Bible over the last few years. Maybe he's got it down to the core, and I hear you're actually growing again now between pastors. Don't you know you're not allowed to do that? <laughs> New people are like joining the church. You don't even know who the next lead pastor is. <gasps> Praise God for that. That's glorious glorious because it's not about any person forbid it lord that i should boast save in the death right i want to end this service is there like anything after i speak we did not discuss this there's a song prior to that song will you stand up with me please i didn't grow up with benedictions it means to speak a good word. I think speaking truth is powerful, even if you're struggling to believe it. So I'm not going to say the benediction. I'd like you to say the benediction to each other. Will you find somebody near you if there's three of you, three works, but not four, because four can be two groups of two? <laughs> I was a math major. My dad's an actuary. Get two or three of you together. Face each other. There you go. You're still looking at me. I hate it at wedding rehearsals when the guy looks at me during his vows. We fix that really quick. Look at each other. It, it, it's okay if you feel comfortable grabbing their hands, place your hand on their shoulders. Some of you husbands and wives haven't spoken yet this morning. This is good. <laughs> this is good. I'd like you to speak truth into the eyes and the mind and the heart of that other person. You don't need to look at the screen. You just need to follow what I say. All right, are you ready? Do not look at me. Here we go. You remind me of Gideon. You're really a lot like him. Please remember... God calls inadequate people to incredible ministries. God calls fearful people to faithful ministries. And God calls doubting people to daring ministries. I can't wait to see what God's going to do through you. Amen. Let's sing. Come on, Craig. Hey, brother. Oh, good morning. Let's sing these words together. This will be our closing prayer. Sing this with me, say, my heart will sing. My heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus. Those words this morning say, My heart will sing, my heart will sing, no other name, Jesus, Jesus, my heart will.
together now say oh I'm running to your arms as we close say and no oh, I'm running to your arms I'm running to your arms the riches of your love will always be enough because nothing compares to your embrace light of the world Amen. You are dismissed.